Sorry, the, the screen is up in here. Some people don't go to lectures and some people do. <laughs> it's okay, you can be forcing you to go with me. Okay, so there is UCU Industrial Action Wednesday, Thursday, Friday next week, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday the following week as well. So if you weren't aware of this, please be aware of it. What the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <clears throat> yes, next week, not this week, next week. Not today, next week. For the lecture? Yeah. Oh. Not the one week I want to do the most. Well, the lecture for this module will be taking place <coughs> next week, okay? The industrial action has, as I said in an earlier message, the industrial action has no effect on this module whatsoever. Okay? Everything will be taking place as set. Ignore anything that anyone else says. This module is unaffected by that industrial action. But you may want to check with other lecturers about what their plans are if they haven't communicated with them already. If they have, then. All good. Any questions? No? So, focus of this lecture used to be on YouTube. 
<clears throat> and then COVID happened. And sad time for all of us. But the big thing that happened during COVID was the emergence of that thing, TikTok. Pre-COVID, TikTok existed, but I couldn't really give a shit. But during COVID, I got obsessed with TikTok because I had nothing better to do. Recorded all my lectures, didn't have to come to work. There's only so many times you can vacuum the house without breaking the vacuum cleaner. So, and there's only so many times you can get absolutely shit-faced every day and try to forget about what's going on. So, instead I turned to my phone, entertain me phone, and TikTok became entertainment. Hours and hours and hours of entertainment for free that glued me to my phone and continues to glue me to my phone to this day because I had really good plans today that I would be in work at a quarter to nine. <coughs> yeah? I had a meeting at nine o'clock, but it was on Zoom. So I'll get into the office, make a coffee, meeting on Zoom, and then I'm ready to go, right? You know, I'm not wasting any time today. I'm all on for it. So set my alarm for 6.30, went off, bang. Lights go on. So I got one of them lighting systems where you can set the timer for the lights and all that shit. And the lights are on in the house, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm lying in bed, but I'm like, I'm set. And what did I do? Open TikTok. I opened TikTok. Now, would anyone like to have a guess at what time I actually got out of bed? Awesome. Higher? Ten. Ten. <laughs> no, I did go to the meeting. <laughs> I right. didn't fuck out of the meeting, but... Um, <laughs> It was actually quarter past eight. So, I spent nearly two hours this morning on TikTok. The reason is clear. At the moment, the TikTok algorithm is providing me with clips from a film from a few years ago called Sully. Anyone seen this movie? Tom Hanks and a couple of... Do you want to explain what it's about? Uh, landing the plane in the Hudson River. That's it, yeah. So I remember the story when it was happening. Um, so this pilot, he lands a plane in the Hudson River and then the rest of the film goes on to like, was it his fault or not? Did he do the right thing? And all this sort of shit, right? I've not seen this movie, but I have seen this movie because thanks to TikTok breaking it up into discrete two minute units of entertainment, this morning, I think I watched the entire film Sully just on TikTok, broken up into two minute bits. So I was like, this is a profoundly depressing experience because I'm sure if I looked on Netflix or Amazon Prime, both of which I have subscriptions to, that film's probably on there. I could just sit and watch it. But no, instead, with my brain as what. Mm, unfunctional as my brain is anyway, as my brain telling me every couple of minutes, you gotta get up. I'm eating at nine. You gotta get up, you gotta have breakfast, you gotta have a shower. You gotta get up. You, you said you were gonna be in work. No, 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 it was much more important to find out what happened at the end of a film that told a story that I already know. Because I saw, I remember the events happening and I've read about what happened in all those investigations as well. So I already knew what was going to happen. There was no surprise ending. It wasn't like he grew, like, you know, gills and became Godzilla at the end and killed everyone. That would have been cool. But that didn't happen. Instead, what happened was he was exonerated in these investigations for being an excellent pilot. I already knew that. I remember reading about it. The fuck is the matter with me? Now, answers on a postcard to that question, address them to the Vice-Chancellor of Swansea University. What the fuck is wrong with Leighton Evans? He will enjoy reading them. I don't have a clue why I am, but it would be funny that he gets a little postcard for those answers as well. So, what point am I making? What, if any, point 
there is a point to what I've just said. It's not just an insight into how messed up I am as an individual. What is the point? Louder, Abby. I think TikTok's really addictive. But TikTok is really addictive. Hmm. Do you feel the same? Do you sit for hours watching stuff, seemingly like a zombie, not really thinking about it, but just carrying on going? Does anyone else do this? TikTok? A few nods. Okay. Is it addictive? I feel like it gets already existing content and reframes it in a more alluring way. And but in what way? What was more alluring? The fact that they are short videos, and so you basically don't have to lose hours and say, "I have to digest the whole movie," but it's like. I have to digest this small video and it's my choice if I can keep on scrolling or not and then obviously the algorithms kind of like push you to scroll. Oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. Because as soon as I flip up two videos later, it's another clip from the same movie, right? So I get trapped in these movie things all the time on TikTok and I end up watching kind of entire movies on TikTok basically. We have to be careful with the word addictive because I don't feel any withdrawal symptoms now. I don't feel like I have to go back to TikTok right now and you know look at what's going on. That's not to say it's not addictive. A psychological addiction to something is different and profoundly different to a physiological addiction to something. And we could argue that TikTok and other content providers like this, the platforms that provide this content, they're not physiologically addictive, but they tap into a very, very well understood mechanism in the brain. I talked about this in week four, the idea of um, dopamine as being um, a key neurotransmitter, and the cutting up of things into short, easily digested packets for us to consume. The film has a payoff, right? You've got to watch a film, it's two hours long, yeah, there's some things happen on the way to keep you interested, but the payoff comes at the end. And you've got to commit to that two hours of time. What those clips on TikTok do is boil that down into two minutes. So I'm getting more and more hits of the good stuff that I get if I watch a movie for two hours. Why would I want to sit for two hours? Waste, waste, spend two hours of my life on this thing, when I can get much more excitement through this mechanism of doing it. This kind of content provision is very well understood, very easy to make, and it proves to be an ideal way of capturing a very important commodity in contemporary times. And that commodity begins with the letter A. Can somebody tell me what that commodity is? Attention. Attention. Monopolizes our attention. The key commodity in the digital economy is attention. Because if you capture the attention of users, all that other stuff, which is vital to the functioning of the uh, digital economy, which I went over last week, you know, getting them to be active, getting them to provide data, which then can be used in order to create profiles, which can be sold to advertisers. You can't do any of that until you have that first building block. You've got to get them in, first of all. You've got to get them hooked. And these platforms are incredibly good at getting us in. The ins here are huge. I haven't put Twitch on here, but that is another platform which actually does this in an extremely interesting way. I, a couple of weeks ago, spent four hours watching a stream on Twitch. Four fucking hours. 
It is a AI generated version of the 90s sitcom Seinfeld, which runs on a continuous loop 24 7. They actually pulled it down off Twitch because it start, the AI started to make what can only be described as some deeply transphobic comments. So they took it down and adjusted the AA settings and now it's back up, basically. When it was down, I switched to a AI channel on Twitch that purely does variations of the steamed hams meme from The Simpsons. And I spent another 90 minutes watching this. It was shit. <laughs> shit beyond belief. There, there must be several billion things I could have done with that time that were more productive. Se I'm not kidding, several billion. My bathroom really needs to be regrouted at the moment. It's a grim job. I could have done most of it. And it would have been better. But I did it anyway. My attention, as little of it as I have, was pulled in here. So really, what we are talking about when we consider these platforms is the optimum attention grabbers in the digital economy. These applications, in particular TikTok, are now exercising almost monopoly controls on the attention of users in the digital economy. So, what are we going to cover? Why do they matter, first of all? And in particular, why do they matter in the, con in the context of social media, which is this module, right? How do we experience this concept of social television? How do they change screen industries? So how actually, just a show of hands, this won't be everyone, how many of you would like to pursue a career in the media after your degree? Kind of does beg the question, what the fuck are you doing your degree for if you don't? But, um, <laughs> but not everyone wants to do that, that's fine, but I saw a smattering of hands there. TikTok in particular is transforming how media is produced. Literally transforming how media products themselves are produced and conceptualised. How they're planned, how they're executed, indeed how the structure and form of them is now being optimised for TikTok presentation. How can you plan a product that has seven to eight actual um, pieces of um, information which we can you know, use all the time. Sorry, I don't know for some reason. Keeps on skipping ahead. What is streaming culture? That is the most important part of the lecture today. But that concept of streaming culture is incredibly important. There is a reason why we are trapped in these loops of content. And it is a cultural form of its own, which is called streaming culture. And it gives us an idea of how we can actually operationalize this kind of platform and how we can understand it. Streaming culture is an extremely important idea because it frames us and it frames capitalism in the contemporary age and the capitalism which relies on attention as being never ending. We are in a phase of unending consumption. The things that we subscribe to and the things that we use for entertainment cannot be exhausted. So in the um, pandemic, right, there are lots of very witty people on Twitter saying, oh, I think I've, com I think I've finished Netflix. Anyone hear this joke? Yeah? Oh yeah, I've, I've spent so much time on Netflix, I think I've watched everything. So, that's very witty. Well done you. Pat on your back. But it's not true. If you watched everything on Netflix, assuming they don't add anything today, you'd have to live to about 500 to watch it all. If you did nothing else, including not sleeping, ever. And I'm assuming you'd die. If you didn't sleep, you'd probably die by the time you're 23, but, it, but I'm assuming you'd die by like 100. Okay? You still have hundreds of years worth of content which you've never watched. 
Same goes for Spotify, right? I've got Spotify subscription, cost me, what is it, like eight quid a month, something like that. It's great, lovely. What do I listen to? Stuff I like, right? And it's got loads of that on there. And billions and billions and billions of other things, which are, you know, which, and loads of other stuff that I do like, which I'm not aware of. Because it's all there. It's like everything, you know? It's, it, all the stuff is there. How am I ever going to exhaust this thing? I can't. YouTube adds so much content every hour, it would be humanly impossible to consume just the content that is added every hour. Never mind all the hours it's been existing since 2005. TikTok works on the same principle. There is always new stuff. Always producing new material. It's unending. It cannot be finished. This is not like Friends. Anyone who's watched every episode of Friends, that's really depressing. Because they're all basically the same. That's, that kind of profoundly depresses me in a really deep state. But I've seen every episode of Friends as well. Because it was on telly every fucking day for about 20 years. And you kind of just pick them off over time, right? But these things aren't Friends. There is never a way that you can actually consume all this information. So streaming culture tells us that actually you cannot ever finish the story. It is always a loop, an infinite loop, if you like. I know in a philosophical sense it's a finite amount of content, but for our intents and purposes, because we can't consume all that content, it is in effect infinite for us the way we experience it. So we are in these infinite loops of content. We jump in and out, but that varies as to how we jump in and out. Sometimes I'll go on TikTok for 10 minutes. This morning it was nearly two hours. You know, tomorrow it could be five minutes. Sunday I might be there all day. Who knows? The world is exciting like that. The point being, streaming culture is unending. And this will help us conceptualize these platforms how we can actually make sense of what goes on. So why does YouTube matter? And first up, people might think, well, YouTube is that social media. Remember the principles of social media. Can you make a profile? Yes, you can. Can you add connections on that profile? Yes, you can. You can subscribe to other channels. Channels can subscribe to you. You can follow people, etc. Can you communicate via YouTube? Well, yes, you can in two very distinct ways. One, you can leave likes and comments on content that you see. But two, you can also create your own content to be seen by others as well. So communication in that way works in both a creative sense and in a sort of paratextual sense. YouTube has a billion monthly active users. One billion different people use YouTube every month. Does anyone know what the population of the planet is? Eight. Eight people? Eight billion. Eight billion people, very good. That means, do anyone want to express as a percentage population of the planet? Twelve and a half. Very good. Twelve and a half percent of the planet uses YouTube every month. That's a lot of people. On average, now this is the bit that's important. The average user of YouTube spends 40 minutes a day consuming content on it. That is lower than Instagram, TikTok, and others. But the type of content being consumed is different to the content that is produced on those platforms as well. So this tends to be longer form content, longer than TikTok, say 30 second TikTok, or Instagram, an image, or a reel, which tends to be much shorter in duration. These tend to be much longer. Four million videos are viewed per day, six billion hours are watched on YouTube every month. And 300 hours are uploaded to YouTube every minute. That's 
a figure that I can't even get my head around. Every minute, you know, if I talk really slowly at the moment to try and stretch out this one sentence into 20 seconds, that means that in the time it has taken me to spend to speak one sentence, 100 hours of content has been uploaded to YouTube just in that time. I reckon it's about 20 seconds. 100 hours just gone up. That felt, when you were listening to me, like 100 hours, but it wasn't. It was only 20 seconds. This is an incredibly important statistic. YouTube is more important to people in the 18 to 49 age group than any network in the United States. And that goes fairly globally as well. Why is that important? In a room full of people who've done PR, but we don't understand demographics. Okay, fabulous. 18 to 49 demographic is very important to advertisers. Can anyone tell me why? It's not that they have money, because actually, people in the higher group tend to have much more money than people in that age group. It's the fact that you're more likely to be able to spend it in the ways that you enjoy. It's a very broad range, that, but if we cut it down to 18 to 35, the vast majority of people in that age group do not have dependents. Most people today, as we've gone through a massive demographic shift in the last 30 years, most people wait until they're in their mid-30s before they have children. So, 18 to mid-30s is your core thing for getting people to buy shit they don't need. Basically, when you get past that point when you've got kids, you only buy shit that you need at that point afterwards because you've got to spend all the money on this other thing or things that you've got. Prior to that, you can spend money anywhere you choose, right? You may not have a ton of it, but you will spend it at least. And you will spend it in weird and wonderful ways. And that's advertisers' dream. So even though advertisers are fully aware that people in that age range are not as wealthy as other demographics, they are more likely to buy products, especially high-end ones, than functional things which actually have a purpose within the concept of family or child rearing and so on. It's their attention that's always been the core thing. Television is dying on its ass at the moment. Television is a profoundly depressing medium these days because there's nothing good on it. It's really bad. I, and you, know, you ask yourself, well, why has it got like this? Why is television so profoundly uninteresting now? And so, well, they've lost the war. Television used to be interesting and innovative when you were trying to capture the attention of this core group. So you always had to innovate. You just had to provide new things. This group is gone. I don't use television anymore. I mean, I know people watch a little bit of television here and there. But by and large, people are not spending their night in front of a television screen flicking between channels for content to watch. That's not what people do anymore. That has gone, that war has ended. And because of that, television has regressed. It's looking now at, okay, well, who is left doing this? And it tends to be older people who have a different set of interests and different set of priorities. So instead of seeing exciting, sort of innovative television now, you see repetition of the same old shit that old people want to watch. You know? This is why, you're like, you know. ITV still has two hour blocks of soap operas in the evening. Because that's what those people want, you know? It's shit, it's terrible. But I guess it works in this sort of very decreased market in which they have. That market has pretty much disappeared and YouTube is a vital part of why it disappeared. Because 
well, I'm not, you know, this is going to be the last of the lecture, but the structural aspects of YouTube are simply more appealing. So, digging up stuff on TikTok is actually more difficult because the statistics have to travel a little bit further and what the accuracy of them can be questioned. So, I found this infographic. I'm not absolutely convinced by some of the claims on this. But they're still bonkers for an hour. TikTok generates $125,000 an hour. That's a lot of money. It's not in social media terms, it's actually not that great. But it's still a lot of money. I like, you know, if I was paid by the hour and I was earning that, I'd be like, I'm in a sweet position. You know, I've got Ronaldo money now, you know, and I can afford Ronaldo lifestyle. 700,000 visits to the websites associated with TikTok, not to the app, but to its subsidiary websites and industries around it. That's a frightening amount of traffic quite frankly. The figure I really like here, $181,250 spent per hour on products, or products seen by TikTok users. That's effectively not far off the economy of a major European country. Yeah. Possibly not the size of Britain, but you know, a mid-sized European country. Probably not as big as Spain, but maybe Poland or somewhere like that. That's pretty much the that that's the their economy right there, just on people spending on things that they've seen on TikTok. I was a little bit taken aback because um, apparently this person is the top earning person on TikTok, and I've never fucking heard of it in my life. So I was like, oh, my finger is, if the pulse is here, my finger's over here somewhere, obviously. But uh, $579 every hour just from TikTok earnings. 600, those of you who have a job, what is your hourly rate? Tenner? 10 quid an hour? 600 bucks an hour. I mean, that's good money. That's decent money. I think my hourly rate works out at something like £40 an hour, something like that. And I think that's pretty good. But clearly not. Clearly I'm doing the wrong sort of job, although I would never be able to earn that kind of money. That's a phenomenal amount. And that's just from TikTok. That's just from like TikTok. When you take into account paid product posts, sponsorships, deals and things. And all the other platforms, yeah. which this person appears as well. So if you make it big on TikTok, there's money to be made, right? The influencer class in illustration again. Last year's group, there was a student who has their content monetized on TikTok. And they've got enough followers to actually have monetized content. About 45, 50,000 followers on TikTok. It's pretty impressive, but I think. Um, that student was not earning that much money. <laughs> Wasn't even earning that much a month on TikTok. So there is a sliding scale here about how people get remunerated. But it just goes to show the traffic that TikTok can generate from this person's presence on the platform equals that they get that kind of share out of the traffic. Now I can assure you that the traffic figure, if Addison Ray Easterling is earning $579 an hour from TikTok, TikTok is earning $5,000 plus an hour from her presence on it. The idea that she'd get any more than 10% of that cut doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And probably far less than that as well. They don't even make it clear in influencer contracts how much of a cut influencer is getting because you would never sign it probably if you knew how much you were being screwed. But at least you get something. So, like 
YouTube. A billion active users every month. 120 million in the United States, which is basically about five-eighths of the entire population of America. That is important for one particular issue. Can anyone tell me what's going on at the moment in America with regards to TikTok? They certainly are. At the moment, there are discussions going on in both houses of the American Parliament for TikTok to be banned in the United States. It's 120 million people use TikTok on a daily basis in the United States. And they are looking to get it banned. Does anyone know why? Competition for a user? Data collection. <laughs> Chinese owned company. Better. <laughs> Competition for YouTube kind of threw me into a spin there a little bit. I don't think Joe Biden gives a fuck. <laughs> the company is owned by a Chinese parent company. Does anyone know the name of that company? Probably on the slide behind me. ByteDance. TikTok is owned by uh, ByteDance. That is a Chinese company. The American government is concerned that a vast data harvesting operation is taking place on the American people. Nobody knows where this data goes. Nobody knows what is done with it. The company claims that no data is shared with the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese state, but they would claim that. And that it doesn't mean it's untrue. That does not mean that the company is lying, but the veracity of that claim can't be verified by anyone, basically. You just have to take their word for it in the contemporary data economy, it's not a very, very good idea just to take someone's word for it. You want to know where things are going. I think, if I remember correctly, legally in China, all the big corporations have to at least be partly owned by the Chinese Communist Party anyway. They so, so they have no independence. Like, they can say they don't share anything with, well, they're with not, the government, but if the they government are asks them to, they have to. Owned. Yeah. That's a very important distinction. They're not owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese Communist Party may have a stake in that company. That doesn't mean that they have control over them, but it doesn't mean that obviously they have some influence over them as well. But again, that's fairly nebulous to what extent that works. We don't really know. Um, and this is really the first big company from that system that's had an impact in the West of this kind. Um, 45% of TikTok users are in 18 to 24 age group. If the 18 to 49 group is gold, 18 to 24 is solid 24 karat gold. Because you guys have no responsibilities whatsoever. In fact, you are noted for your recklessness in purchasing decisions. You may have virtually no money, but you are only too happy to spend that no money on useless shit that you don't need. This is the entirety of contemporary advertising for you. Trying to get people from 18 to 24 to take out an overdraft to buy the stuff that they don't need. This is perfect. Yeah. Isn't it also a lot about pre-concepts? Like, for example, like you were talking about the movie that you watched, the two-minute clips. Like, sure. It's about pre-concepts that we have in our head. Yes, yeah. I'm not going to spend that one expensive thing, but I'm going to spend a series of useful, useless things in this time that all in all will complete the price of this very expensive item. And the same thing is, I will watch a movie, but I will watch two minute clips that complete the movie. It's almost like you segment the achievement of particular goals in that way. Yeah. So if, you know, I'm, it's, a, it's really interesting how payment options have changed to reflect this as well. Does anyone use Klarna? Purchases, at least look, yeah. <laughs> for everything. <laughs> um, everything is being broken down into chunks in order for it to be, seem more achievable. The bill at the end is the same, um, and the, really, the amount of time that it takes to achieve that is the same as well. But if you break everything up in this way, it seems more appealing. Guess. It's a presentation thing more than anything, right? 63% of Gen Zers in the United States use TikTok on a daily basis, two thirds. 20% um, of TikTok users earn more than $75,000 in the United States, which puts them in kind of 
top, I mean, top third in terms of US earnings, I would say, $75,000. That's important because it is not something which just appeals to demographics who have less money. There is also a higher end going on here as well. So if you look at usage, 52 minutes, 100 billion average monthly video views, 34% of TikTokers shoot daily. That's where your content comes from. 68% of TikTokers uh, watch someone else's video, 90% of TikTokers uses, uh, use the app on a daily basis. That last statistic is quite simply incredible. 90% of users use it every day. That doesn't happen with other social media platforms. If you know something like Instagram, which does very well in that statistic, is talking, you know, we're in the low 60%, 50% to 60%. To get 90% of users to use it again and again and again, and remember that doesn't count that in that 90%, you've got people who are using it multiple times a day. That kind of access just doesn't happen with other platforms. ByteDance's uh, value as a company is, well, has actually gone well past that now, actually. It's worth $400 billion as a company. Do you know how many zeros are in $400 billion? 11? <laughs> yes. It's a four with 11 zeros afterwards. Sorry, I had to count in my head then. That is unbelievable. That is an incredible figure. If you look at the advertisers here, 61% of TikTokers mentioned that they tend to buy from brands they see advertised. And 63% consider themselves brand conscious on TikTok. Again, those are figures unheard of in terms of brand consciousness, in terms of engagement with products. This never happened. Social media, as I said last week, has perfected the kind of idea of how to target people with advertising, but you still gotta get people to engage with it. This is doing it in a way that's never been seen before. It's incredible. The reason it's doing it is not actually that clear to us because reverse engineering TikTok's algorithm is really difficult. And it seems like TikTok's algorithms are the reason why it's so successful. But reverse uh, engineering them is really, really difficult. You've got all this stuff here, but this engagement stuff, frankly, is staggering. 43% of users have taken part in duets. Has anyone done that here? You fucking liars. Yes, you have. I have. I like to get with people on TikTok. It's funny. It's good. It gives me... I delete them afterwards, but... It's but nice. how, uh, I think, how do we define engagement? Because is it engagement? Like, is it like one second as we call it engagement, for example, like when we swipe by something? What is the... Um, this is a profound, profoundly interesting question. What do you count as engagement? Yeah. What do you think? What is an engagement on TikTok? Consumption. Nice. What does that mean? <laughs> how, like how do you measure it? Um, how do you measure consumption? How do you measure engagement? What you're really asking is how do you measure engagement? Yes. How do you yeah. how do you classify engagement from non-engagement? Right. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you think you do that? I mean, there's not one answer, by the way. There are several answers, all of which count as engagement, some of which are deeper engagements than others. Likes, comments, etc. Perfect. Likes and comments are usually a good way of, of measuring engagement. But they're not the only way of measuring engagement. Time spent scrolling. Yeah, time spent scrolling, but also time not spent scrolling. Much more important in an attention economy is not to measure the time you spend scrolling, it's the time you don't spend scrolling is actually the important thing. Every interaction is metricized. 
So for each video, I'm not calling them videos, for each TikTok, there is a series of statistics. You might want to you might have asked yourself this question, how do things end up on my For You page? Anyone here ever wondered that? Did you not care? <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna tell you anyway, even if you don't fucking care, because that's my job, all right? Those things that end up on your For You page are not random. Da -da -da -da. You might have already appreciated that. They do somehow, although some can be loose and some can be very solid, correspond with your history of viewing content on the platform, yeah? But they also correspond with the statistical analyses that TikTok runs on every submitted piece of content on the platform as well. So those things which end up on your For You page have gone through a rigorous and very comprehensive statistical analysis to look at how much people have engaged with this, what type of engagement has taken place. Remember, TikTok, like all the other platforms, is in the business of attention. So it puts things on For You pages that it already knows have people's attention. It might not work for you. You know, you might skip through it. But it's more often than not going to work. But, you know, there is in many ways, you know, this is something which we've seen has an attentive effect on people. You might think, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, I'm seeing things kind of just after they've happened. What you've just said sounds like it takes a while to do. It doesn't. It takes seconds to do that statistical analysis. TikTok's algorithms are set up to do this in real time and update constantly in real time and push content across its network in real time to users. Algorithmic processing does not take place over minutes or hours or days or weeks. It takes place over fractions of a second. So when a new piece of content goes up on TikTok and it starts gaining attention from the minute it goes up, TikTok reacts instantly to that. So that the virality of videos is a factor of TikTok's algorithmic profiling of that content. Those algorithms are working constantly, 24 seven. Algorithms don't get tired. Algorithms don't need a coffee break, yeah? So this is happening all the time with every piece of content that goes onto the network. So when you ask, again, how did this end up on my For You page? Well, it ended up there for a number of reasons. It ended up there because of what you do, but also very importantly, what TikTok does as a business to understand what content uploaded onto it has attentive potential and how that is used to target different people. Yeah? So what ends up on mine isn't gonna end up on yours, Abby. You're not gonna watch the crap that I watch, right? Jay, you know, we're going to watch different stuff, but it's all gone through the same process, right? So, why is this important? Well, we've already, a few weeks ago, looked at sharing the self and self-presentation. These are mechanisms for the presentation of self in everyday life. Even if you don't create content, because you are still consciously aware of the kind of content that you are consuming under a profile, etc. when you're doing this. But any platform that creates content to be shared should be considered within this framework. If any of us create content, we are creating an image of ourselves through that content itself. You may be some sort of douchebag edgelord who wants to you know, create that image of themselves and you will post accordingly or you may well be somebody who wants to post an authentic version of themselves, and you may do that accordingly. These are platforms on which we do this. TikTok, sorry, TikTok is owned by ByteDance. YouTube is owned by Google. 
Google. You know, I'm speaking of saying like Facebook is evil. They're kind of not, because although they're evil, at least they see humans as kind of human beings. Google does no such thing. Google has no concept of the human being whatsoever. Google is evil because it doesn't even think of people as people. It purely thinks in terms of data traces. People don't matter, data does matter. So any platform owned by Google is something which is really, really problematic. Google's use of YouTube has inspired others to do the same. And I think the story holds for TikTok. So, Google's model of operation can be argued to be constant, real-time, biopolitical exploitation. Anyone got any clue what the word biopolitical means? Is it like a part of Foucault's like concept of how like discipline and like power is exercised like on people and especially their bodies? It certainly is. What does that mean? Um, <laughs> it's You've like, correctly positioned it. Now tell me what it means. He talks specifically.